It's a story, a true story of his life. Uh, his childhood was uh, very rough uh, with many foster homes. And um, he rose above it in part through baseball and uh, joined the Mariners and has been doing some really interesting things since then, which he will tell you about. But before he does, I wanted to invite Linda up very briefly to um, explain the connection with Newport Church. So as many of you know, when it comes to kids living in foster care, I have a deep, deep passion, and I know that that's shared here among many. Um, you know, when, it, when I think about kids living in foster care, two thoughts come to mind. One, how do we make a difference? And secondly, how do we further understand the complexities surrounding our foster care system that then impacts um, these awesome kids? So I'm talking things like the complexity of systems not working together, um, racial disparity, poverty, mental health, domestic violence, substance abuse, all come together and really have a critical impact on our families and hence our kids. But I know that many of us do feel this call to action. So um, showing of hands, how many of us have been um, foster parents over the years? Yep. How many have been adoptive parents? over the years. We do have many in our midst. How many have been court-appointed special advocates for foster kids? Yes. How many wow. have volunteered <coughs> and or supported Treehouse in some way? And this should actually be everybody in the room because, tree, because Newport supports Treehouse through our benevolence fund. And just want to make sure that everybody has heard our recent news that we have met our five-year goal. We've taken graduation rates in King County from 38 that people support that are directly related to um, kids living in foster care. Any, any other organizations? So I also support Teen Child. Um, so this is just really, I am really, really thrilled to hear this story today. I personally look forward to um, furthering my perspective, further understanding, so that together we can make a difference in the lives of kids living in foster care. So Deshaun, thank you very much. You bet. Are we ready? Yes. So. Let's give a warm welcome. Aw. Thank you, folks. Thank you. Thank you. So Linda pointed out that the graduation rate nationally and specifically in the state of Washington is a subject that everybody's been trying to improve for the last few years, right? So my story actually starts with graduation. This is my actual graduation gown from the University of Washington, right? So <laughs> I've, I've kept it, I've kept it for quite a while because that's kind of where my story starts. Um, Dory mentioned the thing about baseball and that was just kind of for me, just a way to get self-esteem, right? As, as a young man, as a, as a young boy, nobody really told me that I, I could go to college. I didn't know that was an option for me. It was more about my athletic ability. It was like, you're fast, you can run, you can hit, you can do well physically, but nobody just said, you know what, you should go to college, you should think about it. So what happened was when I was 14, I went to go live with my grandparents. And the irony of being in a church is that my grandfather was a minister. And so my grandmother was the first lady of the church, and my mother actually was in the choir at our church. So when I came to live with my grandfather, I was 14 years old, and I was kind of, I, I bounced around to a few homes, and I finally, I ar arrived at their house when I was 14 and a half, and they had so many rules, so many rules, and they were very strict. And my grandfather said, the first thing that you're going to do is every Saturday morning, you're going to go down to the church, you're going to vacuum the church before people come in for prayer meeting. So I had to vacuum the church on Saturday nights. After church, before church on Sunday mornings, I had to go to the church and set out all the, all the Bibles on the pews, set out all the, all the, uh, all the, all the paperwork that they had to pass out for the day. I had to put all of that on the pews. And so he started me off right away, very strict, knowing that I had responsibilities. And prior to that, I, I didn't really live like that. Prior to, prior to having somebody come into my life and provide structure, 
provide permanence and stability. That had never been a part of how I was raised, right? So at 14 and a half, I finally got this man. And mind you, this is, this is I call this a million true stories because this is not just my story. This is across the country, right? This is not just Deshaun Patrick's story. This is stories from, in, in areas that I've had the privilege to speak at, no matter if it's Texas or Brooklyn or Maine or California, Utah, every place that I've gone, these stories are exactly the same. Young people that are living lives that are so temporary and transitional that by the time they get ready to take on life as young men and young women, they have no tools. They have no tools, they have no structure, they have no, nobody that's invested in their lives beyond what they already know, right? And so my story is, is pretty unique in that I've had people that have really taken a, taken a look at my life as a young man and got involved, right? And so when I talk to you about my grandfather right now, it's, it's, it's a very pleasant story because this guy had all the tools in the world, right? And I, I like to talk about toolbox. No matter what was broken in our house or at the church or in one of the church members' house, he had this big blue, big blue pickup truck, probably like a 1958 beater truck. He had a regular church car that we drove in, and then he had a beater truck that he would use to drive around for all the people in the church that needed things fixed around the, around the neighborhood, okay? So my brother and I, we would go with him. So no matter what it is, so when we go to fix a roof for, for somebody in a church, Deshaun, get back out there and get everything we need for the roof. Get the ladder, get this. So I had to go, out, go into the truck, I'd grab the ladder, I'd grab all the tools he needed, we'd get on top of the roof. I'm like, Grandpa, I don't know how to fix a roof. I don't know anything about it, I like, I like to play baseball. I'm a kid, right? But it didn't matter. Whatever it was, he took me with him. So every time I saw him go into his toolbox, whether it was a hammer, whether it was a wrench, whether it was a screwdriver, no matter what it was, he had the right tools to fix whatever was broken, right? And so I started thinking about that as a young man, as I, as I got a little bit older. I started thinking about my grandfather and how he had all the tools. And I started thinking, okay, when I, get, when I get to be a grown man, when I have a family, how do I have those same tools? And was, I was, no, I was not longer, no longer talking about fixing things around the house. I was talking about tools to live life, right? And I was thinking, okay, all the different things that I've been through as a young man, how do I take those things and make them my life, right? And then as I started speaking around the country, I started to figure out that every kid that I spoke to, no matter what region it was, had the same concerns. If I've never had a father, how do I become a father? If I've never had a mother, how do I become a good mother? If I've never had any continuity and stability in my life, how do I provide that for the people that I come into contact with? How do I provide <laughs> stability for my children? How do I, how do I show, that, show my kids that I am consistently <clears throat> present in their life when I've never had anybody in my world be that for me, right? So that was kind of my thought process. So when I met Dory, I was working on the manuscript, it was 2006 or seven, I was working on the manuscript and I'm not sure how we connected, but I said, will you please read this manuscript and tell me what you think of it? And she wrote back and she said, I, I love it, um, it's fantastic and I'd like to, and sh she actually has a quote on the back of the book for, for uh, because you know, like, so like when you when you write a book, you have to get quotes and and um, feedback from other writers or news organizations. And Dory was one of the people who provided the quote on the back of the book. So thank you for that. I, I don't even think I think I thanked you really. I, so now what? What? Twelve years later? Ten years later? Thank you. Um, so what I want to talk to you guys today about is the importance of tools, and the importance of tools in kids whose lives are so transitional. Right? We talked about the graduation rate. So nationally, the graduation rate of children in foster care, I'll narrow this down to you, 400,000 children are in foster care at any given time in this, in this country. Right? Of that 400,000, there's 20,000 who are, they call it age out age. So they're 17 to 18 years old. Okay? Those are the kids who are able to say, hey, okay, I'm on my own now. I'm a grown man or a grown woman. I want to start my life. Right? 17, 18 years old. 
of that number, the 20,000 kids who are at that age, the graduation rate is less than 40%, less, sorry, less than 47%. It's about 46.8%, right? As opposed to nationally, the graduation rate of high school seniors is about 80, 87%, okay? So how do we fix that? So what I've been working on for the last year is a little short film, it's called Charlotte's Toolbox, right? And what I try to portray is how stability and permanence can change the life of a child. Right? So I've got a young man here today named Rowan, who is going to be, he's not going to be Charlotte, but he's going to be Rowan. So Rowan, I need you to come up here. Rowan is going to represent, here's your teddy bear, Rowan. <laughs> and here's your, here's your suitcase. Now, Rowan's going to represent the millions of true stories of these kids around the country. Okay? So what we have here is Rowan's life from the age 10 to the age, age of 18, okay? And I wanna show you how visually impactful it can be when you send a child from this to there without any tools, okay? So what we have for you is Rowan is now 10 years old and he's in his first home, right Rowan? <coughs> Rowan's gonna move to his second home. Got it? In his second home, just think about what happens when you go from home to home? You guys, you guys have grandkids, you have children, right? The one thing that you look forward to when you're at your home is you wanna be comfortable. You wanna be welcome. You wanna walk in the house every day seeing the same face, same dog, know where the kitchen is, know where the bathroom is, know where mom and dad are in the house. You want that every day as a child, right? But when you go from home to home like this, every single time, no, no, you still, <laughs> we're still on home number two. Every single time you move to a different home, think about what a child goes through when they walk through that door with a suitcase and his teddy bear, and that's all he's taken with him, right? That's all he's taken with him or her from home to home is the suitcase, the teddy bear, whatever they have on their bags. But they walk into the home, and it's brand new faces, brand new people, brand new sets of rules. Don't sit there. You can't. You got to be in bed at this time. Uh, we wake up at this time. No, we don't go to church. We do go to church. Whatever it is, it's the it's different rules for different homes. So then he goes to the third home, and this could be within the matter of years, matter of months. I've seen situations of the children that I spoke to um, around the country. The average is about 12 homes, but I know that there's some kids that have had far, double that, triple that, right? But as far as what I know, the average is about 12 different homes that each kid lives in, right? It's a lot of families to me. That's a lot of adjusting for a 10-year-old, 11, what are you now, 10, 11, you're about, well, no, you're not 13. <laughs> so you're about, you're about, he's about 11 right here. We'll say he's 11. That's a lot of adjusting for an 11-year-old boy to do, right? I mean, how do, you, how do you handle that as a young man? You know, you're not, I have, I have kids, right? I have kids that I've been present in their life every day. Right, since they were born. And like I've coached their teams, I've been involved in every aspect of their world, but I understand it because I didn't have that. I didn't have that person or that, that mother or that father to every day I walk in a house, I can say, hey mom, or hey dad, or you know, they say, how's your day? Or how did school go? Or you know, who's your girlfriend? Or anything like that. It was, you know, I didn't have that. But I, trying to provide that for my children wasn't easy when you know that that's not the foundation that you come from. You know, if your life is based on the concept of temporary, everything in your world, you have to work through everything. Not just, you have to work through school because your mindset is set up to be moved all the time. Everything's temporary, nothing's permanent, right? To, gr to give a child permanence, and this is why this is so important when we talk about adoption and how you can change the life of a child, is to provide permanence for one young person, here's what it does for their life, okay? What you think it's doing is just giving them a stable environment. That's beautiful. But what it does, it gives that child the ability to tap in to their own goals. They're not moving around. They're not, they're, their mindset is finally rested so they can say, what am I good at? Am I smart? Am I athletic? Do I like to play instruments? Um, do I wanna dance? Do I want, which college do I want to go to? Those are the things that you provide a child 
when you add permanence to their life. They're able to sit back and relax and be a kid and figure out what they want to do, right? When you are moving, Rowan, <laughs> how's the teddy bear? Fine. All right, good. When you're moving from home to home like this, and now Rowan's in his fourth home, Rowan, I'm probably going to take that teddy bear from you now because you're probably in about seventh grade, and we're going to drop this off. Now, <laughs> now, now, now my buddy Rowan here is in seventh grade, right? He's been through four homes, okay? And this is his fourth, el oh, sorry, he's in sixth grade. I got, my, I got my things wrong here. He's in sixth grade, and this is his fourth elementary school, okay? Think about that same process of walking into different schools every year. Nobody knows you. Your friends from school one, in your rear view, friends from school two, you haven't talked to forever, friends from school three, you only met for a few months because now you're in school four. You, have, you think about what that does to a, a kid. Okay, as a grown people, we can adjust to things in life, right? As grown men and women, we understand that life has those, right? But as this young man, this doesn't make sense to him. He's trying to figure it all out still, right? But think about the psychological things that are going on with this young person right here, right? Every year, he, every time he gets moved to a different home, think about his psyche, his self-worth. Think about the value system. Most importantly, think about that because he moves so long, nobody knows him. Do you know what it feels like to be known? It's great. It's a great feeling when somebody knows who you are. Right? When somebody understands how you work, what you do, what you say, and how you tick. Nobody knows how this kid ticks. Nobody, except for him. If he's, got a, if he's got a drive in him, if he's got a heart to him, if he's got, a, if he's got that a attitude, and a lot of kids who are in foster care have to develop that, they have to develop that resiliency. If he's got it, then he is the only person who knows himself. He's the only person who knows what he's capable of. Nobody else does. His teachers don't know because he's moving around all the time. His parents are gone. He hasn't seen his mom or dad since he was over here. So the only person who really knows what this kid's capable of is Rowan. That's it, right? Next home, Rowan. So that's the point, right? So when I talk about graduating, the University of Washington, uh, I'm going to keep this thing forever just because I never, ever expected to be a college graduate. I expected to be a baseball player because that's what I invested in. I expected to be a baseball player because that's what people told me I was good at. Everybody was telling me from like the time I was probably 13, you keep playing hard, you keep doing this, you follow this, and something really good is going to happen to you as a baseball player. Never one time did everybody say, hey, you might, can I see that book? No, nobody ever said, you might be an author one day. You might be able to write a book one day or several books one day and speak at conferences around the country. Nobody ever said that, right? That was in me, though. I understood at some point that, okay, well, I love baseball. I love athletics. But, God, I mean, could I go to college? This is a very true story for me. When I was four, I told you, when I was 14 and a half, I went to go live with my grandparents. I moved from Ballard which was so different than South Seattle, like, like, especially South Seattle back in the day. Ballard, when I was growing up, was completely Norwegian, Swedish, always, 100%. But my grandparents lived in South Seattle, which was not Norwegian or Swedish. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, so, so my bus ride, when I wanted to go see my friends, I took the number 48 bus, if you guys don't, don't know what that is. The number 48 connects the south, Seattle, south side of Seattle to the north side, and it goes through the university district. So it goes down Montlake, goes through up, 40, up the four, 45th, I think, up oh, 15th, right past the University of Washington. I would take that bus, and I, I would look at the University of Washington as I passed, and I would literally say there's no way that I'll ever go to that school. That school is not made for guys like me. Guy with no parent, no dad, no mom. I thought that that school was made for, uh, you know, <laughs> Q 
kids who had perfect lives, kids who, whose mother and father invested in them, who told them that where they were smart, who expected them to go to college. There's no way that the UW was made for me, right? Next chair. That's a lot of, that's a lot of chairs for a 12-year-old. That's a lot of different places to get adjusted to for a 12. How do you feel? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? But you got to believe in yourself, though, right? But here's the thing, Roran. How do you believe in yourself when you don't have a lot of people that are telling you that you're going to be great? You're a baseball player, right? That's what I heard? All right. So those baseball coaches, they tell you how good you are and what you work on and how you've improved, right? Okay, I got it. I'm a baseball coach too, so I get that. But what about life? What about life? What about the people that aren't talking about baseball or sports to this young man? What, are the, what about talking about value and meaningful things? Like, what is he going to do after baseball's over? After high school's over, how's he going to live his life? Are you smart? Esteeming young people and making sure that they have value by the time they get to be 18 years old, that they can take on the world in a way that is powerful. They can step into the next stage, not whimpering or, or afraid because they don't know what's next. That's the reality for children that grow up in foster care. A lot of people don't, a lot of people feel like, okay, foster kids need shoes, foster kids need jackets, they need, they need the little tangible things that you can actually put your hands on. That's not, that's beautiful when you're, when you're 12. But when you get to be 18 and you've had 100 pairs of shoes given to you, you've had a 20 backpacks given to you, you've had a lot of things given to you, but now none of that matters because you've outgrown the shoes, you don't need the backpack, and everything else that you've been handed is not useful. It's about how do we impact the hearts and minds of kids, not the shoes, those are great, continue to support that, that's a beautiful thing. But we're talking about meaningful connections. Shoes don't change lives. People change lives. Backpacks don't change lives. People change lives. Do you understand? Uh, it's just, this is, this is something that's passionate for me, so I kind of understand it in a deeper way than just backpacks and shoes. I understand that when you inspire and you motivate and you invest in a child's life, go ahead, Rowan. By the time he starts to get to a point where <clears throat> He's 14 now. Let me just count my chairs so I got my ages right. Yeah, so he's about 13 right here, and he's lived in, this is his seventh home. This is average, right? But there's, like I said before, so many kids that have, are way beyond this. So when, we, when you start to see commercials on TV or advertisers on TV about foster kids and what they're asking for and what they need, look at it in a different light. I mean, look at it beyond when they say, support foster kids by donating shoes, <coughs> support foster kids by donating a backpack. Look at it beyond that need to what, to the kid, to Rowan. Look at it to Rowan and how, what, it need, what it means for this young man to walk into adulthood ready, ready to take on the world, right? Go ahead, Rowan, next, next chair. Okay, one of the things that I like to talk about is athletics, right? As a baseball coach, what we try to do is when you take an athlete, I, I coach high school baseball and football too, but what we try to do is when we take an athlete who's really into sports, we try to expose them at an early age to the highest level of athletics they can compete at, right? It's called raising the ceiling, right? So you take an athlete who's 13 years old and if he's really good, you say, hey, listen, you're really good. Let's play you up at a 15 year so that you can compete at this level. And that way, if your goal is to be a college baseball player, now you're now at 13, you're already competing at 15. By the time you're 14, you're competing at 16. By the time you're 15, you're competing at 18 years old, which is the highest level in our state, right? So that's what we do as, as, as coaches. We try to expose kids to the highest level, kids that are on that track. That's no different than kids in foster care. It's no different than kids in foster care. Think about what this young man has been exposed to for all these years. All these years, he's been exposed to abandonment, neglect, insecurities. 
All the things that he's taking with him from home to home has changed. He's no longer a 13-year-old boy. He's, he's 24. As far as what he's been through, as far as what he's had to bear on his shoulders from move to move to move, this is not, I, I have, I, I raised babies that are grown now. I know that my kids at 13 had zero, that all they cared about was school and sports and uh, Xbox. <laughs> That's it. School, sports, Xbox, and a couple other things. They didn't care about the things that Rowan's cares about right now, right? So the, the, what he's exposed to, they shouldn't be. But here's the thing. Here's the thing that I talk to kids about. So what? So what? You can't change any of this. That's the hand you've been dealt. That is, and some rise above it, right? You can't change the hand you've been dealt at all. This is you. So now, what do you do? You actually have to become accountable. You actually have to look around your life and say, okay, well, there's, there's programs out there to help me. There's caseworkers out there to help me. There's foster parents out there to help me. But at the end of the day, these are my two shoes that I have to walk in. These are my, this is my world. Nobody else gets to walk in these two shoes with all of this except for me. So how do you do that? Right? How do you do that? One thing that I realized is when I, even when I was writing this book, I thought that my life had been about this, this resiliency and that I had these bootstraps and that, you know, the bootstrap story where I just put myself together and conquered the world. Yeah, that's what I thought, right? And then I looked back at my life at individuals who invested in who I was. I looked at my grandparents, my grandmother and my grandfather, who t my grandmother at the age of 16 was the first person to tell me you should go to college. But she wanted me to be a, a preacher. <laughs> <laughs> because my grandfather was a minister. She, that, was the, that was the very first time anybody, teachers, friends, parents, friends, anybody had said, Deshaun, you should go to college because I want you to be a preacher. <laughs> okay. Right. So that was the first time that I said college for me? Really? You mean, she didn't say anything? My grandmother called baseball, she called it bat ball. That's how much she didn't care about baseball. She called it bat ball. She never been, she, the first game that she went to for me was my very first game in the kingdom. That's, and so she never went to any other game. Yeah, kingdom. How old that is? <laughs> she never went to any, any baseball games her entire life. She was raised in Louisiana. Um, didn't care about sports. Her life wasn't about that. She grew up on a farm. You know, like she, she was raised, she was born in 1933 and lived her, most of her life in Louisiana in the South. And so her life was not about sports. She didn't care. She loved the Sonics, though. I forgot about that. She did love the Sonics. Um, but she was not into that. So her, everything that she was telling me about myself was different. It, it was not about how fast I could run or how good I could be on the baseball field. She was like, you know, you're smart. You're articulate. You should go to college. And I, so then my, so then my, my bus ride past the UW sort of changed a little bit. It sort of changed, I started thinking, okay, maybe that school is not just for those kids. Maybe it's not just for the kids with perfect lives and mothers and fathers who've been saving up for their kid to go to, co go to college. Maybe that school, maybe one day I can go to that school. That's the first time I started thinking about that, right? Roaring. <laughs> You're such... You're a good dude, man. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, uh, so that was the first time I started thinking, well, okay, I can do this, right? But let me ask you, though, who's doing that for these kids? If you're moving from home to home to home to home to home to home to home like that, it's a lot of home. If you're moving around like that, who's investing in that person, that young man's life beyond athletics? Who's telling him, Rowan? I mean, right now, he's getting serious. He's probably a freshman in high school right here, right? So at, at some point, somebody's got to stop and say, hey, you're good at things. You're smart. We can do this, right? At some point, somebody's got to invest in his life like that. All right, Rowan, <coughs> we're, we're narrowing it down quick. There you go. 
At this point, probably about 10th grade, 14 or 15 years old, here's the thing. This kid has a file, right? I was in Washington, D.C., uh, speaking at Georgetown University, and they were talking about, I was, after, this, after the conference, I had a roundtable discussion with probably about 40 kids that attended the conference. And one little girl said to me, and I, and I was talking to them about, hey, are you guys involved in sports? Anybody doing performing arts? What are you guys into? One of the little girls said, you know what's weird? She said, this is her exact word. She said, it's weird because my foster care files make it to every school that I go to, but my transcripts don't transfer to every school, right? So she's always having to start over and redo grades because maybe she's in one district and she gets transferred out of the dif district and then she has to redo classes or retake classes. But she said, but my files make it to every school, but my transcripts don't. So I've got a file folder. I brought a file folder. Roaring. Next seat, buddy. So all of this, over the years, this is Roran's file. This is what they get to see about him when he's about to age out of the foster care system. Sorry, this is the first time I've done this, so the tape. So this is his file folder, right? Just imagine all these files. Now, this is what he knows about himself. This is what he believes about himself, right? Nobody's invested any other way in him. The only thing that he understands about himself is what is in the files that he's been taking around his entire life, right? Go ahead, Roran. So there he is, right? Now, I put these two other chairs there because I wanted to show you why I believe it's so important to add stability into the lives of these kids. This is this young man's toolbox. Remember I told you about my grandfather and his toolbox? His toolbox was able to take on the world. No matter what it was that was broken, he could fix it, right? Whether it was my grandmother's car, he had the tools for it. Whether it was a broken door hinge in our screen door, he could fix it. Whether it was the lawnmower that my brother and I had to use every Saturday, he could fix it. Whether it was tending the gardens, because my grandmother had her own vegetable garden. We had a garden at the church, and then he had a garden somewhere in the city that we had to go, my brother and I had to go work on. No matter what it is, he had the right tools to fix it. So now we got Roaring, and here's his toolbox. Oh, you're trying to grab it, huh? No, <laughs> no you can. Stand up, Roaring. There you go. Turn around. There's our 18-year-old Roaring, right there. Those are the tools that he's had to take himself through life. And now we talk about the graduation rate. We talk about why these kids aren't graduating. It's, it's not a no brainer. It's a no brainer. It's a no brainer. It's, it's what we need, right? Is, is not shoes and all that stuff. It's fantastic, right? We need somebody to invest in the lives of these kids on a way different level than shoes and backpacks. We need people that are willing to step up and add stability to this person's life. I'll tell you what's not in his toolbox. Understanding completion. His life has been so temporary, there's no way that this is in his toolbox. Every time he moves around, he understands that things are temporary. My grandfather told me one time that the blessing is in the completion. You get the reward when it's done, when it's finished. When the last nail is up or in and the project is finished, that's when you get reward. That's when you get your reward when the last credit has been completed, when the last class has been taken, right? When you, when you can say, okay, I'm done. I finished that. I've completed that. Foster kids, they've missed that. It's a huge, it's a huge vacancy in their world, okay? 
That's not in his toolbox. Permanence. I mean, this young man is 18 now. He's got to go be a man. He's no longer 10. He's got to go live the world, live in this world right now, and function as a grown man, never once having this in his life. Okay? I'm hoping I spelled all these right. <laughs> Stability. He doesn't have that. He's got to be a father. He's got to be a dad. He's got to be a husband. He's got to be an employer or an employee. He's got he's to go become a man. And how do you do that without ever having that in your world? Right? Probably, to me, the most important is continuity. Every day, seeing the same people. Every day, being able to count on somebody. How do, you, how, do you, how do you become accountable when you've never had people to count on? I mean, these, this is, this is 400,000 kids we're talking about in our country every year. Right? This, is a real, this, is, this is what foster care, mind you, I'm not here talking bad about foster care because it does some fantastic things, I'm telling you what's underneath foster care, what's underneath the backpacks and shoes, what's in the minds, why our graduation rate is at 47%. It's because we're, we're delivering young men and women into adulthood who have never had any of this stuff, right? And I just wrote consistency, which is kind of redundant, so it's the same. Um, so I'll tell you this. I have, my, my children are, my daughter is getting her master's degree at the University of Washington right now. My older son is finishing up his baseball career at Vanguard University, California. My second oldest son, youngest son, my second son is a baseball player at Azusa Pacific University. And my youngest daughter is 18 and she's a senior at Jackson High School where I, in Mill Creek where I coach baseball and football. So how do you, how do, you do that when you've never had, when this has been your world? How, how do you become that person not that I'm a great person, but I do feel like one of my greatest accomplishments is being present for my children, right? I mean, we all have ups and downs in life, but how do you become a father, which is the most important thing in manhood, probably, when you've never seen one, like Roran, but Roran's dad's probably somewhere over here. <laughs> how do you do that, right? So when, you deal, when we're dealing with kids, who are in these situations, all we want to see, excuse me, Lord, is this. By the time he gets to this age, how do we, how do we make Roran this guy? I'll hold that up. Green looks good on you, man. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do the chin thing? How long can you hold that? I'm just going to see. <laughs> I'm just going to see how long you're going to hold it. <laughs> So isn't that our goal? Like, how do we get to a point where when we get to these young people, when they're 18 years old, we're at 47% graduation rate, you know? I mean, how do we add stability and, and permanence or value and meaning to their lives and change their experience? And that's all we're trying to do, right? That's why I'm here to talk to you guys about it, what Linda does at Treehouse, and I love the people at Treehouse. They're fantastic. Uh, your CEO was one of my mentors when I started my organization. So I have an organization here in Seattle, Seattle area. It's called Youth and Care Launchpad. Okay, you're good, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> you're so good, dude. I mean, you're great. I'll take the toolbox, too. Can we clap it up for Ron, you guys? <laughs> you go sit down now. Thank you. So I have an organization here in Seattle area. It's called Youth and Care Launchpad. I started in 2012 after speaking at conferences all over the country. And I was asking kids face to face, what is it that you need? What, how can we change your experience? How can we add value and meaning to your life? And I found out that most kids don't have access to extracurricular activities, like sports, performing arts. And if they do, the problem is they don't have the equipment that's needed, right? To participate. I mean, this goes back to the, to, the, to the shoes and all that. But so I started an organization where we collect 
uh, new and used athletic equipment or performing arts equipment, and we work with WIAA, this is Washington State Athletic Association, and tons of foster care organizations, and any child that's in foster care or adopted out of foster care that's involved in athletics, we provide with cleats, bats, mitts, whatever it is. It's a real thing to understand that when you show up to a sporting event or on a team and you have no resources to pay for the cleats that are needed, I, I was that kid, I, I remember that. I remember being 14 or 15 years old, I was on one of the better like select teams here in the state and I just didn't have, I didn't have a bat, I didn't have a mitt, I didn't have cleats. Right? That, that's a really, that's a tough thing to deal with when you're that age. So that's where that comes from. So I started this organization, Youth and Care Allowance Pad, and that's what we do. We try to remove the barrier that prevents the kids from getting connected. It's not about sports. These kids are, I was fortunate after high school that the Mariners saw value in me that they said, hey, here's a contract, play a few years, right? I'm not a stud, or, but I'm not great. I was good enough to tell them, for them to tell me, hey, we want to invest a little bit in you. Go ahead and try it, right? That's my deal. But most kids in foster care, no kids in foster care, are walking out of foster care right into a baseball contract. It doesn't, doesn't work like that, right? So I feel blessed in that way, but I also feel responsible to talk about what it really feels like. Because what if, what, if, what if the Mariners weren't waiting for me at 18 years old? What if they weren't there? What if they weren't there to say, hey, here's a few bucks in your pocket. Here's a contract. We're going to keep you under our umbrella for a few years. Right out of high school, it doesn't happen. And I think about that often. Like, what if, what if I couldn't play? What if I couldn't run? Then 47%, I know for sure. I would be in that 47%, for sure. So as you guys uh, you know, think about how to get involved, or how to change a child's life as you look at these commercials on TV, like I asked you for, just think a little deeper than, than what's in the commercial. And um, actually, I, I, I could talk a lot about this, and I have before, but you guys have to go, and so do I. But I've had a fantastic time, and Linda, thank you for your words on um, Treehouse, and Dory, thank you so much for being a friend and inviting me to speak today. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Hey, so Dory has asked if there's anybody that has any questions. I absolutely am ready to answer. Yes, sir. What does uh, spiritual care fall into that toolkit in regards to being a resource in your life? Uh, okay, well, that, that's a great question. So uh, I have a scripture that I want to read, if that's okay. My grandma would be really happy that I'm reading this right now. <laughs> not, I'm not even kidding. You have no idea. So spiritual, spiritual, spiritually speaking, like I said, I was raised with my grandfather. I was able to live with him from the age of 14 until 18. And I was entrenched in the church, right? And he, everything about my grandparents, they're Southern Christian folks, like, true, real, like my grandmother doesn't do anything without saying something about Jesus. Like every three sentences, and Jesus, and, yeah, and Jesus, and that's her, right? So I, I understood that, and she, she used to tell me that, uh, you know, for what, Philippians 4.13, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. So I understood that, and I believed it big time. I believed it big time, especially as an athlete. You know, to every time I try to go out there and compete, I'd say that. I'd say that to myself. Um, so the spiritual aspect of it, I know that there's a lot of organizations that don't believe in, that d they don't preach Christianity or anything like that. They, they leave God out of it, right? And there's quite a few that um, embrace it, too. So I, I, the answer to that, for me personally, it's always been as... I like, that's probably the thing that's gotten me through the most. Like the bootstrap thing, I thought my, my grandmother, my grandfather, and people that are invested in me, it's definitely Jesus. So that would be the number one. Yep, bet. Yes, ma'am? You mentioned your brother. Yeah. Were you in foster care together? Or yes. Or were you separated? No, that's the beautiful, that's the, that's the unique thing about our story, 
is that we all, I have a sister too, all three of us. Uh -huh. The only time that we were ever separated was when my brother, he got ill as a young boy, maybe like four years old, three years old. And so he had to live in a special care, a home that had like nurses and all that. But my sister and I, we were together. And we, we lived together every, every, everywhere we went. Yeah, no, it's definitely unique. For sure unique. I, I don't know, I'm really blessed. And, and you know, like our childhood, it, it makes us who we are. I, I've never one time have I ever had a woe is me, had a this is terrible. I've always had a totally different attitude about it. Like, okay, yeah, all right, what's the big deal? When we talked about exposure, when we were talking about rolling and being exposed, so as a, at an early age, I was exposed to what I understood about my life. I understood it really early, maybe nine, 10 years old, that hey, there's a lot of craziness going on in my life. My friends don't have this. So maybe a lot of this is my responsibility, right? And so just understanding that, I mean, it's, you don't wanna be exposed to that at 10 or 11 year old. You don't wanna have that understanding about your life because your parents are your umbrella. Right? You don't want to understand that until you get to 17, 18, when you're about to take on your own bills and become a man, right? So I understood those things about my own life pretty early. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. All right, you got it. How is your sister and the four-year-old? Are they doing okay? Sister and the four-year-old. Well, you, 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 you were younger together. Younger brother. The, the brother. My brother and sister. Okay, your brother. Oh, they're doing great. They're doing great. They're doing great in life. I mean, you know, I think we've all had the same kind of experience, the same attitude. Mm -hmm. You know, as, a, as, an, as the older brother, maybe I was a little more protective and had a different attitude. So they're doing fantastic. Yeah, thanks for asking. Yes, ma'am. That's a huge percentage. I, I don't know if she would, Linda might know that, the answer to that. I could research that, I, I, I don't know. But that's, 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 that's a large, yeah, that are gonna experience homelessness. It's a huge because percentage. They don't have the tools. I mean, right. They don't, nobody's saying. They're, they're, they're not equipped, help. right? Okay, I just was curious. No, yeah, that's, that's a huge, question. yes ma'am. I didn't hear the question. Oh, she said of the kids who age out of foster care, how many experience homelessness? So I don't know the exact statistics, but Linda said it's anywhere from one third to 50%. At some point, at some point experience. And that's, that makes sense. And that makes complete sense. I mean, you have no tools. You have no tools that it takes to move from one stage and transition into adulthood. You know, you talk about the spiritual side. What can the church do if we aren't, let's say, an active foster parent physically? Yeah. Uh, and finances, but what can we do as a church to support this as a more supportive thing? Okay, a good question. So I, I was contacted back in September, but you guys don't know what East Side Academy is? Have you ever heard of that? Yeah. Okay, East Side Academy, they have a mentoring program there, and they asked me to be a mentor for a young man in their, in their, uh, in their program. So I'm not sure, does, the church, does this church have a mentoring program? You know, maybe just, you know, all, these kids just need people who say you're valued, you think we care, but, but show it, you know, show that you're, you're concerned and you're, you care about them. So, you know, one of the things that I don't know is I don't know a lot of the answers, like how to do this from like a church per perspective. All I know is that there are things that are set up in place that are helping, right? So like the East Side Academy has their mentorship program. I'm not sure if you guys could, could talk about that amongst yourselves and try to do something like that. But, um, yeah, got it. East Side Academy is housed at Bellevue Prep, which is in downtown Bellevue. Oh, is it? It's very easy okay. to be a part of that. Sure. Oh, good, good point. Yes, ma'am. So when you talk about writing a kid's book. A kid's book. Because foster kids in, in school, they don't see themselves in very many no, uh, no, yes, I actually have now. <laughs> That's a good point. So I, I love to write, and I've shared my writing goals with Dory quite often. Um, 
but I, I had not actually thought about writing a kid's book, but my daughter and I were tinkering around with a book that she wants to write, and so we were kind of messing around with a story, so, because she's, she's, she wants to be a writer too, so, yeah. Good idea, though. You're an author. Oh, are you? Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk, Dory. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll chat it up. Do yes, you have your book here? No, I didn't bring it. I didn't want to make this like a sales, like, hey, you know, so we have to buy my book in the, the, in the hallway the type thing. Is, is it on Amazon? Yeah, it's on Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. Um, yeah. on Amazon. And the name it. again is? It's called And Sunrise Above It. And Sunrise Above It. Yeah. Thank you. Dory will give you information, I'm sure, somehow. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 it will be. And there's a website, too, for all. And what's the name of your...